Math in and of itself wasn't interesting to me, but the use cases for math are very interesting to me. People always tell you, you're young, oh, math is in your everyday life. And you're sitting there, you're going, no, it's not. When am I ever going to use this? How hilarious is that? It came for a full circle of being like, I'll never use this. This is stupid to, oh, this is the entire basis upon everything I do. Yeah. Hello everybody and welcome back to Math at Work. Today I am at Porchlight Studios with the one and only Stephen Ryan. Thanks so much for having us today, Stephen. Thanks for coming over. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing yeah. well. How about yourself? Pretty good, thanks. Good. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do here? For sure. So uh, my name is Stephen Ryan. As, as you said, I'm a musician. Uh, I'm also an engineer, a producer, um, sometimes a player on people's music depending on what they need. Uh, but here at Porchlight, uh, we record music, so what the things you hear sometimes on the radio, Spotify, YouTube, stuff like that, bands come in and uh, we produce their music. This is all it is, this is all I get, the clock is ticking loud and I'm afraid it's running out. The Math at Work video series um, focuses on how math plays a role in several different careers, uh, as, it, as it does, and I dare to say most careers, there's some math in there. Yep. How does math play a role in the work that you do here? Man, in, in, the, in the studio especially, it, it plays more than, than I even understand. There's, there's definitely a, a certain degree of it when I'm building the space that I have to take into account, um, because uh, as you may know and some of your viewers may know, Sounds, notes, it's all just frequencies. And if you have a space, that space is always going to resonate at a certain frequency. So you can come into different problems where you have buildups of frequencies based on the size of the space, as well as just issues with reflection, reflections from your listening position that mess with the stereo field and all these different things. So when you're building a space, you have to take into account what the size is going to be one of the biggest things you try to avoid is too many parallel walls because whatever the space is between that wall you'll have that frequency bouncing back and forth and creating uh, what are called room modes essentially where that frequency will be louder than it actually is in the real world so then you take that sound somewhere else and you go well where did that where did all that low end go that i was hearing when i was in the studio well that was actually the room producing the low end not the speakers or the instruments so you have to treat it to get the most flat frequency response uh, possible. That way it translates across more systems, stereos in cars or headphones and things like that. And then if you can't do the math to get the space right, what you then start doing is you have to figure out different absorption materials or uh, diffusion to stop the, them from reflecting parallel or absorb those frequencies where they're hitting. And again, the the longer the frequency length, the more absorption you need to tackle it. So in, in bigger rooms, you're gonna have issues with lower frequencies, and the smaller the room gets, because the smaller the wavelength is, the more issues you're gonna have with, with higher frequencies. Yeah, so so much to consider in the construction of the room, so many details yeah. to, to get it to sound right, and like you say, so that the finished product actually reflects what uh, what you're hearing in the room, yeah. and, and so on. Wow. Now, in terms of, of graphical displays, like I know from my own experience in, in music, I've done a little bit nowhere near as much as you. Um, how, do, how do they play a role in, in so your work? So, in, in graphical displays, one of the biggest uh, ones you'll see in the studio is a graphic EQ, which is essentially you'll see the frequency spectrum ranging from 20 hertz, which obviously it goes lower, but the human hearing is 20 hertz is kind of where that cuts off a little bit, all the way up to 20 kilohertz. Sometimes you'll have displays that show more or less, but that's generally where you're seeing it. And the way those can help is because we've kind of talked before, in, in music, if you have like a fundamental note 
that frequency is gonna kind of be the loudest in the range and you can see it displayed um, with like a real time analysis on that chart. And every octave above that is just a uh, double. So if, if your uh, fundamental frequency is 400, well, an octave above that is gonna be at 800. An octave above that is gonna be at 1.6K or 1600. Um, and so when you're looking at these displays, it's, it's very easy to A, figure out where there's problems because you can see them peaking up on the display, uh, but B, you can sculpt things more musically because you also might know, uh, say, A440, which is the standardized tuning that most people use. Um, if the song is in A, you can kind of sometimes sculpt around going, okay, I know 440 is a fundamental and here are some harmonics and stuff like that. So you can cut out unpleasant harmonics that aren't in that scale or uh, weird different things like that. And you can even do things like creating um, instruments out of stuff like white noise or pink noise by isolating frequencies that are in the key you're in. I think one of the first things I learned mathematically with music was the, the Fletcher Munson curve, right? Which is how the ear perceives different frequencies at different volumes. And what I found one of the most interesting was, I think the research was even, a large portion of it was done and used by the telecom industry because they needed to be able to use the least amount of power to send that audio signal and they found since the ear is the most sensitive in that three to 4K region, which is also where all the consonants happen, they could send a signal that is much more reduced in frequency and not have to use nearly as much power to send that because we need much more power and volume to hear low frequencies. But as we found out, that's not integral to understanding human speech. So they could narrow, narrow, narrow. And people would always say, oh, we've gotten so much better, so why, why do phones sound so bad? Well, it's literally just because it's easier and cheaper to send that reduced signal than it is to have a wide, beautiful sound. The technology is there, the microphone can capture it. Mm -hmm. um, and over data, you could send that, but there was just no purpose to do it. It didn't serve a purpose. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I did not know about that. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. That um, I myself am a musician yeah. and a bit of a, a, a music gear nerd, so being in a place like this is very exciting for me. <laughs> um, based on, on your own experience, what's, uh, what are some of the, the most interesting, coolest, or most rewarding things about, uh, about your work? Some of the most rewarding things is definitely helping people create something that didn't exist before they came in the studio. Sometimes I, I co-write with people and you're creating something from scratch. Other times they're bringing me a song that is an acoustic guitar and a vocal and you're turning it into a giant rock tune or something like that. And when you came in that morning, it was an acoustic ballad and you're leaving with this monster track with drums and distorted guitars. And it's just, yeah, it's just cool to have a part in creating something that didn't exist at the beginning of the day. One more question for you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you offer to a student who's interested in pursuing a career as a music producer or an engineer? Definitely. So my, my advice would be um, work with as many people will work with you. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, whenever you are in the studio with somebody or rehearsing with somebody or anything like that, uh, leave your ego at the door. You can always learn something from someone. I, like you, you're coming into the studio and you're saying, oh, well, I, I don't do this to the level you do it or whatever, but I guarantee there's something you've come across that I haven't. E even if it's just one thing in the studio or two things, there's always something uh, to learn from everybody. Um, so yeah, listen first, speak second. I guess that would be my advice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, and that is true for musicians too, right? Yeah. So much of being a musician is listening to other musicians. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today and inviting us into your studio. It's been uh, wonderful chatting with you again. I haven't hey, seen you in quite a while. And we'll see you next time and we'll look at more Math at Work. <laughs>